Hello and welcome to another episode of Full Court Finance here at Zacks. I'm your host, Ben Rains. Today we're taking a look at three great stocks to consider buying in 2023 and possibly holding for a very, a very long time. In those three stocks we're looking at today are Taiwan Semiconductor, uh, and Adobe, and Cummins. So three totally different stocks in various areas of the economy that look set up for really long-term growth, and you could possibly get them at solid entry points at the moment. But before we get into everything, remember to sub- subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcast, and make sure to check out our zax.com slash promo page for a look at some of the services, portfolios, and more. So before we dive into these three stocks, it's worth just kind of going over the broader market and where we stand at the end of 2022 to give a better sense of these three stocks in the market and why it might be good no matter what to just, if you're a long-term investor, to consider buying some stocks as we head into the new year. So stocks rebounded through morning trading on Thursday uh, and what most investors hope turns out to be the start of a nice little rally heading into the early days of 2023. We obviously saw some heavy selling in December so far that sent the benchmark S&P 500 back under its 50-day moving average once again. The S&P 500's next support level might come in the form of its 200-week moving average that's provided support uh, so far this year and helped actually spark the initial fourth quarter rally off those late September and early October lows. But the the nice bounce back Thursday could could be helpful in returning to some other new uh, technical levels that the market is watching. Thankfully, many of the stocks are uh, reaching, though, enticing levels. Um, some technical points. So, for instance, the QQQ, which is that NASDAQ 100 tracking ETF, uh, hit RSI levels of 33 on Wednesday, which puts it right on the edge of those oversold levels that lots of traders watch for. In the last time that popular NASDAQ 100 tracking ETF hit those levels was at the very end of September, right before the market bottomed and went on that nice two-month run. So that could be some of the reason why we're seeing that bounce back today is that people are just thinking, hey, we've we got a little oversold and we might see a nice little rally into the new year, that kind of late stage Santa Claus rally. So obviously, though, lingering inflation and higher interest rates and a natural slowdown in the economic cycle, coupled with energy market disruptions and supply chain setbacks, have many economists and market participants fearful that the U.S. is headed for a recession in 2023. Meanwhile, we have Jay Powell and the Fed who are continuing to stress that they have a lot more work to do to get inflation under control. With that in mind, the two-year Treasury yield has climbed over the past several weeks from around 4.18% to about 4.36% on the back of signs of ongoing economic resilience. Still, though, despite that, the uh, two-year yield is still well under its highs from early November when it hit 4.7%. So this dynamic appears to signal that Wall Street thinks the Fed will be able to ease off the gas and slowly lower interest rates sooner than Powell and uh, the rest of the Fed have signaled. And then more recently, China's rapid about face on its zero COVID policy appears to be creating near-term chaos, but the temporary setbacks could prove to be worth it if the world's second largest economy is able to return closer to normal, as the U.S. and many other countries have a, a much longer time ago at this point. So the selling and choppiness obviously could remain in place until maybe the fourth quarter earnings season gets underway in a few weeks, because at the moment we're worried that corporate earnings could turn far worse for 2023, and that would require further recalibration to the downside, though. If executive guidance does end up coming in stronger than expected, stocks could rally, certainly. So obviously, all the uncertainty remains, but what investors with long-term horizons need to remember is that market timing is very hard, and there's that cliche of time in the market beats market timing. And it is worth noting that uh, the S&P 500 annualized a return of about 10% over the past 20 years. But JP Morgan noted at the end of the third quarter that if you missed just 10 of the market's best days, which tend to occur within less than one month of its worst 10 days, you would have reduced that annualized return to just 5.5%. So you essentially cut that in half by just missing the market's 10 best days, which it's very hard to get in and out of stocks to 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 time those things exactly. So that that just another reason why long-term investors and that buy and hold mentality does end up in general proving to be a long-term investment strategy. So with this in mind, investors likely want to buy stocks for 2023. So we're going to look at three stocks uh, that help us take a longer term view that you can hold if you, if you plan on holding for multiple years and maybe even multiple decades that these levels could look rather cheap in the not so distant future. So the first stock up 
as I mentioned up top, is Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. That's a mouthful. Most people just call it TSMC or TSM is the ticker. So we'll just call it various things of that as we talk about it. So Taiwan Semiconductor has really cemented itself as an integral part of the semiconductor market. It's the world's largest semiconductor manufacturer uh, with roughly 55% market share. So the company, so chip companies really of all shapes and sizes turn to foundries such as Taiwan Semiconductor to build their integrated circuit so because the costs and time involved are enormous. So the company makes the actual chips. Uh, it stands to capitalize on the transition to 5G and the ongoing tech revolution, really just everything. Uh, feature semiconductors more than you even can imagine. So can, semiconductors are really the backbone of the digital world and arguably, therefore, the entire economy. The company has deals with titans of the industry, such as NVIDIA and Apple, in the firm is committed to making even smaller chips going forward with it committed to rolling out new facilities that can eventually manufacture three nanometer transistors, which would be some of the tiniest, most lightning fast uh, possible at the moment. TSMC currently produces five nanometer chips, which are uh, which was the, they were the first foundry to provide those offerings. The company last year said it deployed 291, so essentially 300 distinct process technologies and manufactured 12,000 products for its over 500 customers uh, around the world. Uh, T TSMC could become even more valuable as the U.S. and other countries kind of reevaluate their ties directly with China. And this has had uh, TSMC decide it's going to start building some factories in the United States. So this is helped spurred by U.S. government incentives. So it's building some factories in Arizona. And the, com the country, essentially, the U.S. wants to onshore more chips. Uh, the COVID lockdowns and everything, kind of the, the supply chain issues have really made countries like the U.S. and beyond want to have more of the things that matter in their country built in their country. So meanwhile, obviously, the chip industry is historically very cyclical and the COVID boom and now bust uh, has rocked the industry even more than usual, but chips are not going out of favor and investments will return sooner than later. And really a bet against chips and Taiwan Semiconductor is a bet against kind of economic growth over the long haul. So despite that near-term industry gloom, chip executives still expect global sales will double to over about $1 trillion a year in the next decade. And the company has topped our quarterly earnings estimates for nine straight periods, and its earnings outlook has held up relatively well, all things considered. So at the moment, our estimates are calling for about 27% sales growth this year to about $72 billion, and then another 7% sales growth next year. And we're calling for about 54% adjusted earnings growth. And then a bit of a pullback next year, about 9% decline from this big year. And this would follow solid growth for the company for a long time. So it did 20% growth on the top line before that, 33% growth before that, 6% before that, 2% before that, 13%. So you can see we've we've gone through that big boom recently, and we're now going back to more normalized times. So as I said, the chip industry in general is very cyclical, but it trends upward over the long haul. So TSMC currently lands a Zach's record number two buy based on its positive earnings per share revisions activity. And five of the seven brokerage recommendations that Zacks has are strong buys. And investors might also be pleased to note that the stock's tumble mixed with its stellar fundamentals saw Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway make a pretty massive investment in the stock back in November. Berkshire paid roughly $4 billion for 60 million shares of Taiwan Semiconductor, putting the chip maker into its top 10 stock holdings. Uh, and investors might want to consider following one of Buffett's any mantras at the moment, which is it's far better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price than a fair company at a wonderful price. So he's essentially saying that now TSMC is sitting at a price that is it's, it's great for a stock of its caliber. So uh, TSMC stock is up 670 percent in the past 15 years versus the Zach's tech sector is 150 percent. And the stock is now still up about 30% in the last three years, but we should note it's down 45% from its peaks, and that even includes a recent surge. 
So the stock is trading at around $75 per share, which marks 48% uh, or it's 48% below its current average Zach's price target. So huge near term upside for TSMC stock at the moment. And then obviously the big downturn has completely recalibrated its valuation levels. The stock is trading at 12.7 times forward 12 month earnings, which is not too far off of its uh, lows which it hit rather rather recently before this big bounce back and well below its highs. Uh, it traded at above 30 times forward earnings uh, not too long ago, and it's now trading well below its median over the last 15 years of uh, 14.5 and well below the broader Zach's tech sector, which is still trading at 19.4 times forward 12-month earnings. So alongside its valuation and upside, it also has a dividend, and that's yielding around 1.9% at the moment. And it boasts a really strong balance sheet. So investors with long-term horizons might want to consider TSMC as a play on the, the broader tech revolution that's not going anywhere and the crucial role that chips play in the economy. Now we're going to change uh, views a little bit, but we're going over to a, a name that maybe more people know than TSMC, and that is Adobe, which trades in the ticker ADBE. Adobe could be kind of considered the best of the rest of those big tech names. It's not in the same air as Microsoft and Apple, but it's kind of a champion of a vital segment of the software market with an impressive subscription business that's helped it post between 15 to 25 percent growth uh, for a seven year period. And it's coming off a big year that we'll get to uh, at the end of 2022 because it just reported not too long ago. That kind of growth is highly impressive for a company that went public in the mid 1980s. And a lot of this is due to its subscription software services that include Photoshop, Premiere, and many others uh, in this broader world of creative and design software. Its products are used to help everyone from actual Hollywood movie makers to students edit videos and images and create artwork and pretty much anything you can imagine doing on a computer in that world of creativity uh, Adobe's products allow you to do. They also have document and business portfolio that ranges from PDFs and e-signatures to marketing and commerce and beyond, uh, workflow digitalization. So it's expanding its efforts as well. And the company is prepared to bolster uh, its offerings even more with a planned roughly $20 billion cash and stock deal to buy the privately head, held software for Figma. The relatively little known company specializes in helping digital creators collaborate through uh software. So the company's offering should be able to integrate really well with Adobe's portfolio that provides uh, real benefits in a world where work is getting done on individual computers and even when people aren't in the same office. So this this scared Wall Street a little bit when the company first announced that back in September and the stock sold off really heavily. Uh, it's possible that the company's overpaying at a time uh, when growth fo growth focused tech valuations are being crushed. But it's really difficult to argue with Adobe's track record and its outlook uh, in an increasingly crowded software market. Uh, as I mentioned, most recently, Adobe topped our Q4 FY 2022 earnings estimates on December 15th and provided really solid guidance despite all of the economic slowdown fears, which could be hopefully a sign of good things to come in the bigger fourth quarter earnings season that comes up in a couple weeks. But Adobe has showed its strength once again. So going ahead, Adobe... We're calling for another 9% of revenue growth in 2023 and then another 12% revenue growth in 2024. So just this continued stable top line growth. It's really impressive. And then we're calling for another 11% earnings growth on the bottom line in 2023 and then 15% earnings growth in 2024. Just really impressive, stable growth for a company that makes a product that uh, its users find pretty much irreplaceable. So Adobe's falling stock price coupled with its strong earnings outlook has it trading where it was kind of right before it changed to a subscription model roughly a decade ago. So it's trading at 26.7 times forward earnings, which might be still a little rich for some people's blood, but it was trading above 50 times uh, not too long ago. And it's trading way above that uh, in the 2013-2014 uh, range, so it's now trading well below its median over the last 15 years of 37 times and closer to the broader tech sector. Uh, so valuation levels are starting to look more enticing. Overall, the stock's up about 90% in the last three years to beat the tech sector's 40% climb. 
It's also up 780% in the last decade versus Tech's 160%. So Adobe, which lands a Zach's rank number three hold right now, is down a whopping 50% still from its November 2021 peaks. And it's trading 20% below its average Zach's price target and 70% under one of its highest price targets on Wall Street. So but right now it might be a good time to consider buying this company Uh it just it shows how valuable it is to its clients and customers and just how irreplaceable uh, its software offerings are because it gave really positive guidance for 2023, even though everyone's worried about a recession and all of this slowdown in spending. So Adobe certainly looks like a long term uh, buy and hold heading into 2023, still trading 50 percent below its own peaks. And the last stock we're to look at today is totally different than these two tech names that we just talked about, and that is Cummins, uh, which trades in the ticker CMI. Cummins manufactures engines and powertrains of all shapes and sizes, from diesel to electric. The historic U.S. engine maker is also going kind of all in on a cleaner future having gained traction in hydrogen fuel cell technology and far beyond the company's new power division includes batteries fuel cells hydrogen production technologies and much more uh, cummins is focused on that new age powertrains including advanced diesel natural gas hydrogen engines hybrids battery electric and just tons of other lower carbon offerings uh renewable electricity it's its ceo and the company in general are going kind of all in on the next hundred years of uh power and engines the company completed a key acquisition in august a deal brought in a leading maker of electric powertrain solutions for commercial vehicles and industrial markets. Uh, the company then at the end of November closed a deal to buy Siemens uh, commercial vehicle business to help further accelerate its development of electrified power solutions. And then if we look back even further, the company in early October announced that it would begin producing electrical electrolyzers, excuse me, electrolyzers in the US. The move is part of an effort to drive forward that green hydrogen push. The U.S. federal government is supporting some of that effort as well. And as a quick note, uh, hydrogen is the simplest and one of the most ab abundant elements, uh, but it doesn't typically exist in nature by itself. So today, nearly about 95% of hydrogen produced in the U.S. is made from natural gas reforming. Uh, so electrolyzers are used to split water into hydrogen and oxygen, but completing that process is currently really expensive. So that next frontier is being able to bring down the costs in Cummins is going all in on that, and they could be kind of one of the vanguards of what people see as a, a possible big uh, source of energy going forward. Cummings revenue climbed 21% last year to top its pre-COVID levels, and Zach's estimates call for its sales to climb another 15% in 2022, and then another 12% in 2023 to climb above $30 billion. Meanwhile, suggested earnings are projected to climb about 6% this year, and then surge to 34% next year. And its EPS estimates have held up really well, or I guess rather well, all things considered, and it currently lands as Zach's rank number three hold. The stock has climbed about 12% in the last 12 months, so the stock's doing well, uh, versus Zach's econ sector's 55% decline. CMI has also crushed the market and its sector over the last 20 years. The stock has regained a ton of momentum recently as well, up 19% in the past three months to hit new highs in mid-November. Despite that climb, the stock is trading at a nearly 50% discount to its own highs and 15% beneath its median over the last 10 years at 11.4 times 4 12-month earnings. And this also marks a nice discount compared to its industry despite that, that massive outperformance. Overall, the stock is up 1,500% uh, over the last 25 years, and that easily tops the S&P 500, which is up 360%. So Cummins also raised its dividend every year for more than a decade with a current 2.6% uh, yield topping Caterpillar's 2% and other industrial manufacturing titans. Uh, Cummins helps the economy literally move and it's ready for a future that features new types of transportation offerings, engines, and power solutions. So certainly worth considering at the moment. So that does it for another episode of Full Court Finance. Until next time, I'm your host, Ben Rains. And remember, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot us an email over podcast at zax.com.
This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.